Good evening, everyone. Time for another silver update. Wow, these are exciting times, aren't they? So we're looking at the one minute chart. I think we're looking at the one minute chart of silver. And what an interesting day. So we want to pull back out to, let's go to the five minute. Um, so yeah, you can see now we're going to have to go out to the hour just so we can get a view of the trend lines I have drawn in here. So you can see we got a test of the downtrending resistance line. And we got a big day, a big couple of days. We got a breakdown from a failure of that. Uh, basically the third real test of it, it failed. And it failed at about 3150 and then we dropped pretty serious uh, number of drops there. Uh, so the big question is going to be where is it going to bottom? And you know that that's for people that want to stack. We're going to have the discussion of you know if you're a true believer um, because markets are different if you're a true believer. And I'm going to show you with some stocks that I traded. But uh, the main support points, we cut through one, and that's roughly the 20, uh, the $30 level. Uh, I have it drawn in here as about $29.83, but it's basically 30 bucks. We cut through that. Uh, we cut through this uptrend uh, line. And that's a pretty significant line. It's been in place since March or so. And we definitely cut through that. The next stop probably is the 2850 level. That's an important level. $26 is an extremely important level. And then down around 22. And where is it going to go? I don't know. You tell me. Um, but I wanted to talk about, you know, when, if you're, if you're a true believer, you know, because a true believer is somebody that's looking for, I discussed before about the difference between buying on technicals and buying on fundamentals. This is going to be absolutely key. Uh, technical buyers would have been absolutely slaughtered because uh, it depends. I mean, most technical buyers would have been looking for a buy here and then looking for a retest and, and then uh, uh, breakout. So could it be a fake out? I mean, how many got sucked in? I have no idea because I don't trade paper silver. But um, yeah, this could be a very good uh, takedown of some longs because if they were buying the breakout, because they were buying technicals, because they were trading paper, because they were trying to book a quick profit, they could get taken to the cleaners. And that probably, I think Ted Butler used to say that that accounts for a huge percentage of the moves in silver is uh, these groups taking each other out, especially the traders. I never got that deep into the hedgers versus the traders and all that stuff because for me, I don't really see a point in analyzing fake numbers. Um, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. But we did break this trend line. Um, uh, my best guesstimate is we'll probably test the 2850 we could test the $26. But that's not really what I wanted to address here because uh, the, the key is if you're a true believer or not. If, if you're not a true believer, then you're gonna get demoralized and just say, oh, I'll throw in the towel. If you are a true believer, you're gonna be like, okay, where do I get back in? Or, or get more, where do I get more? It's not a matter of getting back in. It's a matter of getting more. So I wanna take you to a couple of stocks that I traded just to show you because uh, the difference between buying on fundamentals and buying on technicals. Uh, before I do that, <laughs> there's so much to talk about, but uh, a quick look at the NASDAQ. Um, we've got a nice air pocket there. Uh, those tend to be, uh, in this case, bullish because it went down. In the, other, in the bear case, it would be the other way. But these gaps are very important because there are traders on the floor and, and traders 
in stops that didn't get filled or got skipped. Some people set limit prices. Uh, you can set a limit order that will immediately execute upon the opening of the market. That's the way the floor traders take you to the cleaners because they open it much lower and then they trade it back up and take you out. Or you can set your stop to, tr to execute at the specific price. Obviously, there aren't stops on the NASDAQ, but the individual stocks that make up the NASDAQ. But if you had a stop on the NASDAQ and your stop was at 20,191, you didn't get filled. It ran past you. So a lot of people have an incentive to come and fill these back in. If they don't, if these don't get filled in, they become bare items in the other direction. If we try to get up to this and we can't fill it, or if we just keep going down, that's a real serious bear signal. And uh, we've got to keep our eye out for bear signals in the stocks because we know how overvalued they are. I think with the NASDAQ, we'll just look at a one month chart. So you tell me, is that overvalued? Does that chart pattern tell you that, wow, the correction could be ugly? That's what it says to me. But you know, do your own DDI, I'm not going to think for you. This is not investment advice. So let's get to the stocks that I want to talk about. The first stock I want to talk about is going to be Exxon. Now Exxon is a stock. I know this one because you can see how many technical lines I have drawn in uh, that I've been following pretty closely. Uh, so this is one stock that I was accumulating and I actually started accumulating it due to interest rates because at one point the, the dividend was, I think the dividend was 7% at one point. I believe I began to accumulate this stock around this breakdown here. So I would start buying on these falls. Now the move down, I don't think we're on a daily chart. We have to go to a daily. But during the 2020 crisis, we'll call it, um, the moves down were pretty dramatic on the daily. So I was already into this stock when we started to get these. Uh, and you, you know what happened? We had the price of oil go to zero. Yeah, that's right. The price of oil went to zero. Uh, that was another one for me. I had to sit here and think, okay, we've got a company that's paying dividends. They're profitable. Uh, they're in the oil business. Is oil done? I don't think it's done. So what I did for that year was pretty much just buy every week. I just kept buying as it fell. And then when we had the catastrophic drop to zero oil and Exxon followed, then I pretty much bought as much as I could carry. I don't think I ticked the bottom. I don't think I bought Exxon at 30 bucks but it was awfully close. And then I just held on, added a little bit. I don't think I moved in that stock again for way up in here somewhere. I think it was over $100 when I started to take profits. I might have taken profits early. I honestly don't remember. But so yeah, there, that, that's an example of accumulating a uh, fundamental, something based on fundamentals. So you're buying on fundamentals, not on technicals. That's how you buy on fundamentals. Um, you buy the dip, and if the dip gets worse, you buy more. And if the dip gets really, really bad, you buy a ton. Now, you can only do that if you are 100% confident in the fundamentals of whatever you're buying. Now, let me give you another stock. This is another stock that I bought, and this was much more recently that I was involved in this stock. Uh, and this is a chart of big lots. So, so you can see also I have quite a, quite a uh, number of trend lines drawn in. Um, let's just pull it to the two hour. Uh, so when I was active in this stock was during the period when the stock started to uh, act up and started to look like it was putting in a bottom. Uh, I was active in it in here, in here. I got out of this stock, believe it or not, I actually got out of this stock somewhere in here. I was, I didn't get out of it on this spike. Um, 
but uh, the stock was dropping. It, it may be, I think I got out on this rally. But the stock was dropping, and uh, and I had been accumulating the stock. Nothing serious, just accumulating it. And th it, there comes a point when you're accumulating. I was buying this in fundamentals, and there was this speculation of bankruptcy of hovering over the whole time. And I was figuring if we get a turnaround, we're getting a turnaround bounce. If the company survives, we could get quite the rally. So I was kind of picking and choosing spots and adding on lows and maybe selling a little bit on rises and just trying to build a position in the stock. But when I saw this new low, that was when I decided, you know what? This stock is not acting healthy. It's not acting the way I would expect it to. And when push comes to shove, I'm actually not buying on fundamentals. I'm buying on technicals. I'm buying for a technical bounce. And I couldn't hold it. And the reason why I couldn't hold it is because I just couldn't say to myself with certainty, do I believe 100% that this has value? And I had to say, no, I don't. And so I had to get out. Um, and I did. I don't think I took any losses in it, but even if I would have, I still would have gotten out. Um, at the same time, I was playing First Majestic Silver. At, do I believe in First Majestic Silver on a fundamental basis uh, to accumulate? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> There's no way. I mean, I said before, I love Keith Newmeyer, love the company, but no, it's not silver. It's a company. So that takes us to silver, and hopefully that explains to you the difference in mentality when there's something that you fundamentally believe has value and is underpriced, and something that you're hoping has fundamental value and you're looking for a bounce. Uh, those are two very different things. So silver, uh, people who know the fundamentals, who know the value, they stack it with confidence. They just put it away and don't worry about it. Now, I wanted to talk about uh, how the price responds in the real market. So I chose this time to go to Atmex and look at the 100 ounce bars. These are pretty good because these are numbered Inglehards. I mean, yes, they can be counterfeit, but I mean, they have a number on them. You can drill them. There's going to be a point, obviously, where they're going to be drilled. I don't think that's, you know, in any question you know when you're talking three thousand bucks and a counterfeit might only cost you maybe 200 to manufacture yeah you're at some point you're going to have to find a way now you don't have to drill them to test them there are other ways there's displacement there's all kinds of different ways you can verify this bar it's 100 percent silver but the point i wanted to make is that this is a good bar to uh look at the price response in the real market versus the fake market. Now you can see here, it's, I have not refreshed this yet. I'm going to refresh this to prove a point to you. But you can see right here, this one is straight up 31 bucks an ounce. So we've got silver trading at 29.50 and that's 31 bucks. That's a buck 50. That's not bad. That's not a bad, um, spread. So let's refresh it real quick. And it's 3095. So you can see this price does change. You can lock this price in. You can buy. I, I don't know what the time frame is. I think they give you let's see. We'll add it to cart. Maybe they'll it's not showing. Some of them give you 30 minutes, some give you 10 minutes to lock in. But, uh, so what does that mean? What does it mean that AppMax, and this is, I'm only using AppMax because at, I've used AppMax. I know AppMax. Uh, you can use whoever you prefer. I don't know if they keep real-time prices. But uh, as far as AppMax, um, they're going to have to hedge the silver. Now, how many of these do they have? They got a hundred of them. 
So they got 100, 100 ounce bars. They have to hedge this. They're not in the business of investing in silver. They're not in the business of investing in gold. They're in the business of buying and selling and shipping and making a profit. Uh, they're not investors. They're, they're sellers. So obviously they have to be hedged because if, if they buy a whole bunch of silver eagles or a whole bunch of these eagle heart bars or a whole bunch of anything and the price absolutely tanks on them, then how can they adjust their prices if they're not hedged? So what does that mean? It means they're in this same paper market. All these people who sell you physical silver have to be in this COMEX market. Now that has a tremendous amount of implications as to how it feeds back into the market. These people are extremely vulnerable. They can get on the wrong side of things. That's another reason why it's in their interest to control these prices through their paper machinations. There's a lot of damage they can do to real businesses that sell these things that they, they're just going to have to expand their premium. So I'm sorry, I'm going down a rabbit trail. Let's get back to topic. So what are the premiums? Well, you can watch the premiums. The premium is real easy here. It's about a buck fifty. So you can get 100 ounces of silver, 31 bucks. You write a check out for 3,100 bucks and get yourself a 100 ounce Engelhard bar. Pretty good deal. Now, when the market is trading furiously, you also want to come back and check. You want to just mark it in your mind. Okay, we were running a buck 50 above spot. When the price moves to Let's say the price moves down here to 26 bucks. Are you going to be able to get an Inglehard bar for 27.50? Or will it actually, as a percentage, reduce? Maybe 27.25. That's what you have to watch. Uh, as I told you before, when I was buying silver buffaloes in 2008, when the price of silver was $8.50, the buffaloes were $12.50. So there was a premium of 50% of the value of silver. Uh, translate that today, that's $45 an ounce. So silver's trading at 30 bucks, but the cheapest physical silver you can get is this bar would cost you 4,500 bucks. That's the kind of thing we were looking at at those times. And that's the kind of thing we may be looking at again. That's the kind of thing you have to watch. Uh, if you're stacking, you have, if you're a stacker, Again, let me use the term true believer. You truly believe in the value of this thing. You truly believe that the pieces of paper or digits that you hold in your bank account aren't worth the paper they're written on or aren't worth the, uh, uh, the space on the hard drive they're stored on, then you're looking for places to convert them to real money, which is gold and silver. So you're cheering these things on and trying to find out. So I'll, I'll, I'll be there for you. I'll give you my speculation as to where that is. Right now, very bearish. We've rolled over, we failed, and we've broken down. Um, most of the, the last thing I'll say on this, most of the time when you get one of these, you don't get a chance to buy. They usually happen in the middle of the night, after hours, whatever. So we'll watch how this one resolves. I mean, it, watching silver for many, many years, it wouldn't be surprised. I would not surprise me one bit to wake up tomorrow morning and see the price of silver up here at 3150 Would surprise me a bit. I've seen it before multiple times. So we'll leave that at that. Uh, are you a true believer in silver? Now I wanted to address another issue and it mainly goes around on TikTok and uh, it's in the conspiracy. And let me bring up the conspiracies real quick. People want me to comment on current events. 
I'm not going to comment on current events, especially going down conspiracy rabbit holes. I don't have enough time in my life. I've wasted enough time in my life uh, speculating as to who's behind what, who did what. I don't need to speculate. If they want to show us, they will show us. And if they don't want to show us, they will not show us. And you will never know. Um, you simply will never know. Uh, if we want to go back to the Kennedy assassination, the origin, the original conspiracy theory term, where the term comes from with the magic bullets and things like that. Remember that? Were you alive for that? Um, I think, did Trump say he's going to release that? I don't know. I don't have time. I'm not going to waste my time on this stuff anymore. I've wasted way too much time. If they want us to know, they'll tell us. If they don't want us to know, they're not going to tell us. So, figure it out. Because I don't have the time for it. You tell me. But anyway, uh, this is something that a lot of people speculate on. Uh, and we're looking at Microsoft. I'm thinking we're going to see a bear market in a lot of these. These multi-trillion dollar companies. I think people are going to be shocked. They're going to be, they're going to be speechless. Their jaws are going to be on the floor. Uh, because uh, these stocks can turn into the Exxons of the world that just sit there and earn money and don't go anywhere forever. The AT&Ts of the world. Uh, I showed you AT&T the other day. Um, just to show you, AT&T, which is a good company, if you look at the revenues, I mean, I'm not going to speculate on how well they're run, but if you look at the, just, just the statistics, the revenues... I mean, AT&T and Verizon, these companies bring in more cash than you can even imagine. These are real companies making real profits. Well, look at this price. It's been dead since 1995. The price of, the price of AT&T is the same as it was in 1995. So can this happen to Microsoft? Absolutely. 100% this can happen to Microsoft. Microsoft can go down 90% and stay down for 30 years. It can happen. It probably will. But that's not what I want to talk about. I wanted to talk about these guys. Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street, and Fidelity. Now, Microsoft happens to be the perfect picture. Not every stock is the perfect picture, but just about every stock is the perfect picture. So these guys talk about, uh, oh, these people rule the world, these DEI, ESG people. Uh, it's not what you think. Vanguard does not own BlackRock. I, I'm sorry, Vanguard does not own Microsoft. Vanguard is not deciding, um, is not buying and selling this Microsoft stock for themselves. Neither is BlackRock, neither is State Street, neither is Fidelity. They're buying it for you. It's your 401k plan that is filled with all this Microsoft stock. If, if every single one of you tomorrow morning, I mean every single American citizen tomorrow morning went to their 401k and took 100% of their 401k and moved it to money market funds and out of stocks and bonds, and put it strictly in short-term cash. That's usually, when I have a 401k, I keep it all in short-term cash. Uh, normally, I keep it in, if it's available, I keep it in a FDIC insured short-term cash. And yes, those exist. You can keep your 401k in earning 5% FDIC insured short-term cash. If 100% of the American public went and moved all of their 401k money into short-term cash, what do you think would happen? How much Microsoft stock do you think Vanguard, BlackRock, State Street, and Fidelity would own at that point? What would happen? Here's another one, T. Rowe Price. What would happen to the market? I can't even imagine what would happen to the market. It would absolutely crater. So who's to blame? Who's to blame for all this uh, conspiracy, DEI, ESG, these people taking over the world 
and uh, using your money against you. Who's to blame? You are to blame. You are 100% to blame because you give these people your money and you let them do with it whatever they want. They vote your shares for you. They buy and sell for you. If you're too lazy to do your own investment, they'll do it for you. If you're too lazy to do your own health care, if you're too lazy to research your own symptoms of your own medical issues, and you just go to the nearest doctor and do whatever they say and take whatever they tell you to take, well, I mean, I don't want to sound cruel, but you're going to get what's coming to you. And if you just trust these people to invest your money, you're going to get what's coming to you. It's not going to be pretty. So let's do a refresh here. So 3103. Um, we're bouncing around. We'll come and revisit this one. Uh, the big question is, you know, if you're a silver stacker and you believe in it, uh, where are you going to stack some more? That's the big question. Keep your eyes on the premiums. Uh, these companies that sell you gold and silver, they're not in the business of being your friend. They're in the business of making a profit. They need to make a profit. And because they need to make a profit, they need to hedge. And the only place they can hedge is in the paper market. So if you keep your eye on things very carefully, you can actually get a deal and they'll, they're kind of selling to you at a loss, but they're making it up in their paper. So um, that's the kind of thing you want to look for if you're a true believer. And we'll talk to you next time.